this is a, a talk geared to people who have no idea where Badami is, so if some of you also don't know where it is, it may just fit. Anyhow, a little bit of personal autobiography, you have to forgive me. When I was um, 21 years old, 49 years ago, and I had hair on my hair, I was a, an architecture student in Melbourne. I made a trip to India, and through a set of circumstances, ended up in Badami. And then I decided to go to Aiholi, and from Aiholi to Patadakal. The only way to go from Aiholi to Patadakal was to walk along the river. So for three hours I walked along the Malprabha River and back. And when I got to Patadakal, the temples were inhabited. And I still remember somebody with a Singer sewing machine in, the, um, in one of the temples, because those temples were used as residences and shops. It's of course all different. So, I went back to Australia, which was where I was studying my architecture, and as I got less interested in being an architect, I got more interested in studying about India, and I was advised to go to London, to the School of Oriental and African Studies. I got there, and they said, well, we don't really have courses. What shall I do? Like this? Is that better? <coughs> Instead of attending courses, I had to do research. And to do research, I had to pick a topic of research. So they said, as an architect, what would you take as your main topic of research for a doctoral thesis? So I said, I would like to study the temples of Badami, the early Chalukya temples of Badami. Nobody in London had ever heard of the temples of Badami. So I had to go to this committee to argue, why would you want to study these unknown temples? What makes them special? So I had to give some reasons why they were worth studying. And some of the reasons are, First of all, a transition technically from rock-cut architecture to constructed architecture. One. Two, beautifully preserved, remarkably well-preserved monuments of a very early date. There are more early temples in this area than in any other site in India. The temples are also at sites very close together, which is economical. Thirdly, the temples are built in different styles next to each other. There is nowhere else in India where you can see northern, southern, and local style temples built within a few meters of each other. So, the Chalukya monuments in your part of India have something which is very special, which cannot be found anywhere else. So I arrived there at the site with two other architects, and we made measure drawings, and some of the drawings I will show you tonight. And those of you who want to part with some money can buy a book with all of the measure drawings from my dissertation because this was a big, heavy job for me to do. I was young and I could do it. And this gave me the experience that I could then apply when John Fritz and I started to work with Satya Prakash and all the other students from Karnataka. So, let's start the talk. This, of course, is geared to people who don't know India. You know where you are. But it's down here, just south of the Krishna River. But the location, remember, this is the southern zone with the Dravidian-style temples. This is the northern zone, and even the western zone, with the Nagara-style temples. So Badami is located at the interface between this group, this stylistic tradition, and that stylistic tradition. So this is where the Deccan, that part of Karnataka we call the Deccan, is so important. And this is just a sketch plan to show you where everything is. So if you haven't been, here is Badami. Here is the Mount Prava River. It flows like this. And halfway in, inside the valley is Patadakal, and is, here's Aiholi. It's about 25 kilometers across here. So we're talking about monuments in Badami, at Mahakuta, which is a sacred site, at Patadakal, and Aiholi. So these are, you see, quite a confined area. This is the Mount Prava Valley. And it was the center of this kingdom, of the, of the Chalukya kingdom. And we call it the early Chalukya kingdom because in, in the 11th and 12th century, another kingdom came up with the same name, and we call that the later Chalukya kingdom. So that's a sketch plan. And this is Badal, one of the most beautiful towns to be found anywhere in India, encased in this red sandstone landscape. We are on one cliff, looking across the town, there's the lake on the, to the right, and we're looking to the other cliff, and at the top you can see a structural temple here, which we'll look at in a minute, and behind us we have these rock-cut monuments. And this is the cliff. 
the, the South Fort, as it's called. These are the steps that lead up through this rugged sandstone landscape. And on the right, you can see one of the cave temples. These are, of course, not natural caves. They're artificially cut into the rock. We, we call them caves, but of course, they are man-made. Shows you how the landscape is left uninterrupted. And suddenly there's just a slice into the cliff to make a building that looks like it's structural with columns, but actually it's part of the mountain. It's monolithic. This is the second cave at Badami. And these are usually dated to the very end of the 6th century, so a very early date for this type of architecture. This is the famous dancing Shiva outside Cave 1, and one of the great masterpieces, I would say, of early Indian sculpture. It doesn't have the circle of flames that you see in the Tamil Nadu Natarajas. This is a Karnataka Chalukya dancing Shiva with 18 arms, some of which are almost cut free of the cliff. So it's cut into the cliff as you go into this temple, which of course is dedicated to Shiva. This gives you a typical plan. This is cave three, the third cave. Um, and this is the one that is dated exactly Shaka 500, which works out at 578 in our era. So it is very rare to have a dated cave temple from the Hindu cults. So it is the earliest dated Hindu cave temple that we have in this part of India. And the layout, you can see there are columns dividing the interior into aisles and spaces, just like a building that is constructed, even of wood, but here, of course, cut out of the mountain. And at the very end, here, you would have an image of Vishnu, because this is a Vaishnava monument. And when you stand in the um, outer uh, co uh, corridor, at the end, you have this great seated Vishnu, and look at all these wonderful columns, all of different types, and the other ones here on the outside, you come in here. But all of this is part of the mountain. When you're in it, it feels like a building that has been constructed, but actually it's been excavated. So with enormous skill into this beautiful deep red sandstone, which is very hard and has endured very well, and means that you get the details extremely well reproduced. This is, of course, Shiva, seated on Vaikunt, the, the serpent, which wraps here, see the coils here, and comes up with the multi-cobra hoods here, holding the conch and the disc. So a typical, grand, rather royal type of image, um, showing to the visitor that this is a sacred space dedicated to the god Vishnu. And at the other end of the same corridor, if you look to the right rather than to the left, you will find this rather fierce image of Narasimha, Vishnu, of course, in his man-lion form, leaning on a club, but that club has now been smashed. We don't know when, but the man-lion is here. You see the lion face of the god, and this slight bend, which is very typical of Chalukya sculpture at the end of the 6th century, and all sorts of accessory figures are filling in the space beneath beneath here and above there. So these great panels, and there's a third one. This is, of course, uh, Trivikrama, Vishnu taking the three cosmic steps, one of the most famous myths from Vaishnava legends. Here he's kicking up, you see, taking that great step, and he holds all these weapons. Look at the crown there, the sword, there's the disc, and this sort of monster, the kick is going towards this demon. This is larger than human size and cut out of the rock face beside the cave. So enormously impressive. But as you go into the cave and you look up, these are the sort of images that you see. These are not gods and goddesses. These are very human figures. These couples, humans, men and women, are embracing in a most affectionate and alluring manner. And these couples are very uh, usually situated beneath trees, sometimes with flowers. And this is a sort of magical motif of amorous human activity that shields the outside, let's say shields the inside from the outside, and is on these brackets, these angled bits of stone that actually don't hold up anything because they're part of the mountain. And every bracket is different. I think I have another one here. They're among the most charming things that we have from early 
Chalukya sculpture. Here you can see the flowers in the tree. And she's turning her head affectionately towards her path. So it's absolutely beautiful. And also what is very intriguing in Cave 3 at Badami are these fragments of murals. This, these are not, as far as we understand, portrayals of gods and goddesses, but courtly women. And it's possible that this is what remains of a scene showing courtly life of the Chalukya rulers. We can't be sure because it's so damaged, but look at the delicate face. And it is the most important fragment of painting after a junta in the Deccan region of India. So Cave 3 is, is very well worth visiting and examining. And this is another cave, this is Cave 1. The numbers are just, the lowest one is 1, the highest is 4. And this cave is of notice for the, for the beautiful carvings. Look at these fluted, part fluted columns and the designs here. It's a Shiva temple, you can see that with the Nandi. And the design on the columns. Every face on every column is different. And it is all made up of jewels, garlands, monster masks, foliation, and then these extraordinary scenes of this human um, torso dissolving into foliation, embracing a fish. We don't know what this means. Somebody here might have some ideas, but it seems to be a popular thing. We have it several times in the art of the Chalukyas. Anyhow, fanta fantastical imagined scenes cut in shallow relief with enormous precision. So there's very sharp designs. And of course, it's the ceilings are the glory of these cave temples. The Chalukyas, for some reason, specialized in ceiling panels. We hardly find them anywhere else in India as magnificent. So when you go into cave one and you look up, you see this coiled naga, coiled uh, cobra, like this, a human torso, multiple cobra hoods, and it originally, this figure had two hands holding a garland. We know this from other examples. Here the garland is smashed. Look at the beautiful foliation here. See, every inch of this panel is treated either in full relief or very shallow relief. So it's a magnificent composition. Also, we have these marvelous figures on the other, above the other parts of the cave. These are, of course, flying figures. This funny posture, you see with the legs bent like this, means flying through the air. And you can see the billowing draperies here. So these are just sort of Gandhava couples, we call them. Celestial couples, air flying through the air. They are auspicious, good luck. They, they make a, a sort of magical contribution to the protection of the interior of the cave. Now we're going to Aiholi, which is a, um, a town still inhabited, 25 kilometers or so from Badami, uh, where there's also a wonderful cave temple known as Ravana Padi, or the Rock of Ravana. You can see the whole thing is the great rock, and this is carved straight in here, that's the entrance. And here is a fluted column, which had this on the top, fell off, and it's possible that something was written on this column which would have told us something historical about who made the cave, when and how, because we have other columns like this with writing on it. Sadly, this one is too eroded, so we, nothing needs to be learned from it. This is what the cave temple looks like inside. It's, it's a magnificent, though small, interior. Every um, surface is covered with sculpted figures. So we have here this figure holding a trident and this figure. These are sort of guardians. This is a combination of Shiva and, and, and uh, Vishnu, Harihara. And behind us are other images. And this is the lingam that is worshipped here. And, and look at these little dwarfs, these gunners, which go, of course, with the mythology of Shiva, all carved out of the sandstone. And on the left, we have this scene, this amazing dancing Shiva. This is a panoramic shot by Surendra Kumar, um, it's not curved like this in reality, but it's a way of showing the seven mothers which are in attendance on Shiva, with all these multiple, one, two, three, four, five, ten-armed dancing Shiva with Ganesha and with Parvati. So it's a complete tableau, a complete sort of story of Shiva dancing in the company of his wife and all of the seven mothers in one of the side shrines. It is here in this shrine on the left. So when you come in on the left, this is what you see. 
And if you proceed further into this cave temple, you will see this magnificent image, of course. This is Durga um, slaying, spearing the buffalo demon. So can you imagine, here I am, an, a young architecture student. I'm measuring all these temples. But what am I seeing everywhere that I look? Scenes of Hindu mythology. So I had to get to know a little bit about Indian sculpture, Indian legends, and I'm not a specialist for it particularly, but it gave me a taste for the art of the temple. So I went from architecture to the art, and from then occasionally to painting too. Now, just after this phase of rock cutting, and for reasons which we don't know, suddenly they stopped cutting into rock, and they started building structural temples. That is, they started making temples out of pieces of stone cut and assembled without any mortar, just dry stone masonry, we call it, sometimes secured with iron clamps. Now, this is the temple at the top of Meguti Hill above Aihori. So it's sometimes called the Meguti Temple. And it is Jain, and it faces north. It is quite unusual. And we know the historical details of it because on one side there is this inscription. And this is in a South Indian script, which nobody today can read. Most of you people today are you have to be a specialist in Sanskrit language. And apparently it's extremely poetical and very high class piece of literature. And it tell us, tells us that Purikeshan, the king, Purikeshan I, in a year equivalent to 634, had this temple built. And it is the earliest temple, structural temple in South India. I think it may be the earliest structural temple with a date that we have for India. And this temple is built in what we call the South Indian or Dravida style. So the, the, the way in which the walls are constructed and the configurations of the walls are typical of the Dravida style. Let's see if I have a... So, <clears throat> vertically we have a basement, we have the walls, backwards and forwards, and then we have an eave, an overhang, and then we had a tower. What you see there is a replacement, it's not the original tower. To get an idea of what the original tower must have looked like is this temple. Now this is the so-called Upper Shivalia on the, on the cliff overlooking the town of Badami. It probably dates from the early years of the 7th century, and you can see there's this amazing tower. And the tower itself is conceived like the walls, you see the projections, recesses, pilasters, and these bands. So it goes like a pyramid, and at the top we have what a square to dome roof, which in South Indian vocabulary is known as a kuta. Don't worry about that. So this is a sort of South Indian and early Dravida temple. And these are the earliest Dravida temples that we have in South India. We know the Pallavas in Tamil Nadu also built temples in this style, but none of them are as early as the ones in Badami and Aihori. And this is the drawing that we made of another temple, which is the most complete one of these early Dravida temples. This is the so-called Malagiti Shivalya, which is also on one of the cliffs above Badami. And here you can see how the temple works architecturally. We have this, these mouldings, which we call the basement. Then we have the walls here. And you see we have projection, recess, projection, recess, projection, recess with a window, projection with a sculpture, and so forth. So the wall goes in, out, in, out, in, out. And every time it moves, you have a pilaster. That is, a little column which is part of the wall. And then the walls are overhung by this eave and a parapet. And a parapet is a piece of wall that goes up above the roof. Roof is at this level. And here along the parapet, you have other little roofs, a little barrel vault here, a little kuta, a little square to dome roof, etc., etc. So this basement wall parapet is typical of the Dravida style. And then the whole thing is reproduced here wall and parapet, and then we have an octagon to dome. So that's the tower over the sanctuary, which is inside there. Porch, mandapa, or hall, and sanctuary or gavagriha with a tower. So that's the classic Dravida scheme, probably the middle of the 7th century. This is one of the sculptures on the Managiti Shivalya. <clears throat> this, of course, is Shiva. It's a magnificent piece. We have the impression that it is pre-carved, that the whole piece was carved and then set into the wall. And you can see it shows the god Shiva with this amazing hairdo and a sort of halo, his attendants holding the trident. And I think a snake here. So a typical... Um, Shaivite formula. 
And on the other side of the temple, in exactly the same place, is an image of Vishnu. In spite of that, the temple is dedicated to Shiva because there's a linga set into the temple. But um, our friend Surendra, who took the pictures, couldn't take a very good one of Vishnu because there's such a narrow ledge there, he would have had to step over the edge of the cliff and we didn't want that. <laughs> now we go to Patatakal, which some of you may have visited, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which has the most evolved and grandest temples, structural temples, of the Jalukias. And what we're looking at here is a pair of temples in the evolved Dravida style, dating probably from about 740 or so. We don't have the exact date, but we know that two queens of one of the kings had this temple, these temples built to commemorate and celebrate their lord's victory over the Pallavas. You know, there was a lot of trouble between the Chalukyas and the Pallavas, a lot of coming and going. And uh, sometimes it was it was good for the Chalukyas and sometimes it was bad. But this was obviously a victory. And when, when um, the, the king returned, the queens, these two sister queens, commissioned these temples. And this is now known as Virupaksha, and this is now known as Madhukacha. But originally they were named after the, the queens themselves. And this type of temple, again, um, celebrates the evolution, the most complicated evolution of the um, Dravida style. And we know this information because here on this column, this little stump of a column, all this is written down. So it says, my grandfather built this temple, my father and his queens built this temple, and I did this. So just the information we like to have, but sadly we never have enough of. And this is the drawing that we made of the Virupaksha temple. So you can see we have worked quite hard to get this type of architecture. But again, you have the basement along here, you have the walls, with all these pilasters articulating the way in which the wall goes forward, back, forward, back. We have windows, we have sculpture panels, we have porches, then we have the parapet, then the whole thing is repeated in simplified form here, first upper level, then again second upper level, and then the top of the tower to get this pyramid over the sanctuary deep inside the temple. So this is the porch, the mandapa, and the sanctuary with the tower. So a huge evolution in 100 years, if you go back and think what this one looked like, say in the early part of the 7th century, and then you have this in the early part of the 8th century, you can see how Chalukya architecture evolved. So obviously the architects were always questing for more complicated and more satisfying architectural forms. And this Virupaksha temple is a veritable showcase of sculpture. Beside the entrance, we have this marvelous image of Shiva appearing out of the Linga. It's a Shiva temple. And while this is a fantastic image, just look at this up here, with these peacocks with these wonderful tails, and these flying figures in Lakshmi up here. So, a magnificent way of integrating sculpture into the architectural setting. And on the other side, we have this, Vishnu kicking. And again, we have these aquatic monsters, we call them Makaras, with these tails. So, it's not just the iconography of Hindu gods, it's the whole decorative system in which all of this visual material is integrated into the wall. So, all carved as part of the... So this is all part of the wall, and this is pre-carved and set into the wall. A typical sculpture of Shiva. Very high quality, very high quality figural art. You can see he has fangs, so it's Shiva in a slightly demonic aspect. And again, all these accessory motifs, a dancing Shiva up here, part of the architecture. And then we have these windows that, that admit light into the mandapa within. And these windows are virtuoso displays of sandstone carving. You can hardly imagine it's cut out of a single block of stone. It's so lyrical and free with this sort of artificial but sort of imagined foliation. The um, Chalukyas seem to have made a special love of windows. Look at this one. These are a pair of peacocks. Peacock-like birds, you see with these tails that dissolve into this. So every window is different and again advertises to us the skills of the carvers who were employed on the temple. And as you come into the porch, we again have these human couples. And most likely they are attired in the courtly dress of the day. It's tempting to imagine 
that the Chalukya kings and queens and their courtiers dressed like this. Whether they were as handsome as this gentleman and his lady friend, we have no way of knowing, but uh, you can see they're beautifully dressed with rich, rich costumes, beautiful hairdos and lots of jewels. So as you come in, these affectionate couples flank you and give protection to the God within. But we also have guardian figures like this, just to make sure that nobody unwelcome gets in. These huge figures, they're larger than human size, leaning on these clubs. They're fangs, so we know that they're nasty. You want to make sure that you can get through. But carved out of the column. You can see here's the column, and the sculpture comes quite out of the column, but it's joined to the column. So this idea of a figure carved out of the column. So really, among the greatest pieces of sculpture we have from early 8th century in the And over the ceiling, on the ceiling, over the porch as you come in, Surya riding in his chariot. So here is the god Surya holding the two lotuses. Here is Aruna, his charioteer, and here are the, I think they're three, three and one, seven horses riding through. See these little clouds. So it's a celestial thing and it's on the ceiling as you come in. So very unusual scene. And this is what you see when you enter the Virupaksha temple, this series of columns um, defining the central aisle leading to the Linga sanctuary. And there's a little bit of worship going on here, not a great deal. It's the only temple at Patadakal that is in worship at all. And these are the types of scenes that we have on the columns. Every face of every column has these bands of mythological scenes. And here you can see Hanuman raised up on the coiled tail, which is one of the famous scenes from Ravana's court, uh, from the Ramayana, with all this decoration. So, and then we have another scene with the churning of the cosmic ocean here, again repeated here, and then Durga riding on the lion towards the buffalo demon Mahisha. So it is, a, it is like, a, again, another catalogue of Hindu legends, but not all of the scenes are identifiable. There are a few that we have never been able to identify, and specialists in Canada, legends and literature, are still searching for the stories that seem to have been lost, but we have the stories depicted in stone. These, of course, are easily identified. And in one of the side shrines of the Virupaksha temple, we have this totally amazing piece. Not in great condition, because it's oiled and it's in worship, but this, of course, shows the goddess, with all her weapons, thrusting her trident, into the body of Mahisha, who is here shown in a human form with an animal head. And this three-dimensional sculpture, completely cut out in the round, twisting and turning, must be one of the greatest, um, I would say, feats of an Indian carver at this point, probably in about 740, before the middle of the 8th century. Because in 755 or 756, the Chalukya kingdom was invaded by the Rashtrakutas from Maharashtra, and that was the end of the Chalukya, or at least the early Chalukya phase of architecture and art. In front of the Virupaksha temple, we have this pavilion, in which, of course, we have Nandi. So the idea of housing Nandi, the bull of Shiva, in a separate structure is something which is also developed by the Virupaksha architects. And here we, here we see that it's not just a simple pavilion, but a very elaborate piece of architecture. And inside, we have this Nandi. Now this has been sort of plastered a bit and oiled. It's an original Chalukya piece out of, out of one block of sandstone. And you can see it's still in worship. And he's a very handsome fellow, I have to say. But he's not quite in original condition. It's a little bit altered. Now, I've been showing you rock-cut monuments, the cave temples at Badami and Aiholi. I have suggested to you the evolution the growth, the development of the Dravida style from Aiholi, Badami, through to the, the great Virupaksha temple at uh, Padabakal. And now we're going to look at a completely different type of architecture which coexisted at, um, in these sites, the Chalukyas, at, you know, at the same time. Now we are, we are at Mahakuta. Mahakuta is a um, sacred spot with a natural spring. And the natural spring is dammed in this wonderful little pond, and the water is very fresh and green, and you can see lots of youths love splashing in it. And I have to tell you that sometimes when we went measuring in Mahakuta, we joined them, it was really very nice. And overlooking the tank is this 
Kankuri Temple. Now, this temple is built in a North Indian style. Now, you don't have to be scholars to understand that this looks different to the temples we've just been seeing. You can see the tower is curved, it has all these horizontal elements, and look at these little ridges. We call them amalakas with one here at the top. A very simple chamber with a North Indian tower. They, we call it a shikara, and then a little porch. And this is called the Sangameshra Temple, and it's of interest for the lovely sculptures. This, of course, is half Shiva, half Parvati. The, one of the most beautiful, and I would say charming images we have. Again, probably late 7th, early 8th century, we don't have a date for it, but it's in the, it goes with this Nagara temple. And on the other side, we have, of course, Vishnu as the boar, rescuing the goddess Earth, another. And if you're not sure what it is, here you have it in English, and here in Canada. So. <laughs> Very useful, and you can... I guess this, I can't read it, but I guess it says this. So. Sensitively applied by the temple committee. <laughs> but nonetheless, and so when we reproduce photographs of it, we have to tone down these sides because it's a little bit ugly. But anyhow, the sculptures are wonderful. Now here's another temple which has a similar tower. You see here, this is a Shikara tower, and this is added to a temple with a very plain exterior. This contains a mandapa hall with a nice porch. This is the, this is now at Aihori, which among good it's called. And up on the tower, we have this, the frontal face of the tower has an enlarged horseshoe arch with dancing Shiva. So we know it's a, a Shiva temple, because the faces, the frontal faces of the tower, you see here, tend to be marked with this special sort of horseshoe arch, like a Chaitya arch. It has, of course, a long history in the Deccan. It comes from Buddhist architecture, but here there's no Buddhist reference, it's just a design. Again, you can see these little ribbed elements. And this temple is of outstanding importance for the ceiling panels. So inside this, the temple, if you had gone there before about 1926, you would have found these ceiling panels. But at about that time, these panels were found fallen to the floor and were removed to the Bombay Museum. So in Mumbai, the greatest piece of sculpture that they can show in the sculpture gallery is this trio of ceiling panels from the temple at Aihori. This, of course, shows Brahma in the clouds with all the sages, his three heads are visible, seated. And this, of course, is Vishnu reclining on the ocean. So they're magnificent panels, and the third one shows Shiva and Parvati on Nandi. So there's a trio. We have Shiva and Parvati, we have Brahma, we have Vishnu. Even though the temple is dedicated to Shiva, all three gods are represented. Now, this shows you the next stage in the evolution of the Nagara, the North Indian style. This is a much more complicated design. I'm sure all of you can see that. Even if you can't understand why it's complicated, you can see it's all full of little elements, very, very complicated with its top. This is at Patadakal, and it's only a few meters away from the Dravida style temple. And it was probably built at about the same time. We don't have a date for it, but we have no evidence that this is built at a completely different time. So we're developing this notion that different groups of architects and craftsmen and sculptors were simultaneously working, were employed by the Chirurgias working at the same site. And this is, as I said to you before, this is something which we do not have at any other site that I'm aware of in India. And this shows you the crisp detail from the tower. You can see this, this arched four we have here, large, little. Here we have a half an arch with a trefoil, and another half arch. So half arches, half arches, big arches, little arches, little full arches, big full arches. If you manipulate all these elements, you get this mesh, you get this complicated design, all of manipulating a single motif. And this is how the northern style, the Nagara style, evolves. And you can go to nor in northern India to various places, Badoli and Rajasthan, various places in Madhya Pradesh, and see this type of evolution and we can compare it. But in those places, you do not see Dravida temples, of course. This is the most complicated of all the Nagara-type temples that we have in the Chalukya, early Chalukyas. This is the so-called Kashi Vishvanath at Patadakal. And here, two and a half meters away, is the Virupaksha temple in the Dravida stuff. So, why they were built so close together, we have no idea. We can just 
scientists speculate, and you can see the whole tower it dissolves into like a net or a mesh of interlocking arches. It's missing its umbrella, its ribbed fruit motif at the top. So it's the most evolved of this type of design, and we have every reason to believe that the temple was completed before the middle of the 8th century, when this site was more or less abandoned after the invasion of the Rashtrakutas. A detail from that temple, and look at these complicated designs. How we ever measured these, I have no idea, but we did make measured drawings, and some of them are in the book of this temple. So it is an up-to-date Nagara-type temple, as up-to-date as Nagara temples in other parts of northern and central and western India. Now we come to the famous Durga temple, which some of you may know from your visit to um, Aiholi, and is of course of outstanding interest for this plan. You see it has this, what we call an apsidal plan, that is half circular. Here is the sanctuary with a circular pita or pedestal, then the temple itself is here, you see, that's the main temple, and here's the porch. Then the whole thing is encased in a veranda. And in this veranda, we have these wonderful panels. And the temple is very intriguing because it is not dedicated to Durga, as you might think, because it has this name. It's named after the Kannada word for a fort, a Durga, because it was used as an outpost in the village in the 19th century, and when some of the British people came to record it, they were told this is the Durga temple, meaning the fort temple. It was probably dedicated to Surya, the sun god, even though we are not 100% sure it's likely. This is how it looks from the front. You can see it has a, um, a shikara, now room, and on the porch and veranda we have lots of these couples. So as you come in, you go through and past all these protective amorous couples. So, not in great condition from the outside, but on the inside we have these splendid carvings. Shivalini against the bull, and the piece, you see, is cut rather crudely the columns are cut, so we have the impression that maybe it wasn't intended for this temple, but it was brought from another temple and sort of fitted in rather clumsily. We don't mind because it's a splendid piece of carving, and you can see it has this almost three-dimensional quality, because the limbs are cut out very clearly from the back, because it's one panel, and the um, bull gazes towards us as the god affectionately leans on it. Wonderful piece. And this is Vishnu riding on Garuda. Here's Vishnu, a bit broken, but still a wonderful piece. We have the disc, the chakra here, with, and here is the conch, but missing that back, that back hand holding it. So again, it looks like it's been put here, maybe not intended. So we can't be quite sure of the dedication of the monument. Now this is another temple at uh, Patadakal. It's called the Papanata. You have to walk um, five, ten minutes from the main group. But it's worth it because the temple is very intriguing in many ways, architecture. It has this typical <coughs> northern India, this sort of Nagara tower. And you'll see in the picture I'll show you next, these Nagara type pediments, these little headings over sculptures. But it has a South Indian, a Dravida type parapet. So now we're getting the two styles coming together. And maybe the two groups of workmen are starting to combine and be employed on the same project. We don't know what circumstances would have brought them together, but it's very remarkable. So we get now, the f I wouldn't say exactly the fusion, but the combination. So, a typical North Indian basement, North Indian little niches with these funny little, you see these little pediments, we call them, made from arches, and then this South Indian, typical South Indian parapet with this long barrel vaulted roof, we call it a shala, and this panjara, or this end of a barrel vaulted roof. And these sculptures are also of enormous interest because here we have the great epics, especially the Ramayana, the story of Rama, and the Kirat Arjuna, the story of um, Arjuna fighting a hunter who turns out to be Shiva over a boar. So this narrative sculpture is very interesting for us. Here we have Rama flexing the bow. The uh, monkeys are here looking on. And sometimes we have little inscriptions which help us, or if I could read it, it would help me, but I can't. But they have been translated, telling us what is being depicted. So here, of course, we have the hunt for the monkeys. And this is meant to 
indicate the bridge over to Sri Lanka as the monkeys build the bridge and so the army can go over and then at the end we have the climactic battle between Rama and Ravana which is just at the entrance of the temple and this is how you enter the temple don't get caught up with this modern blue door sensitively painted by the archaeological search but uh, just look at the, the way in which the door is framed here we have these, these makaras, these, these aquatic monsters with tails, you see? Here we have makara heads. So it's extremely ornate, and we have all these characters here, river goddesses and attendants, lions. So the whole doorway, the entrance to the temple, is extremely ornate. And when you get inside, it's even more ornate. This is the climax, I would say, of the ornate um, Chalukya style. If I'm speaking to a European audience, I would say it's Chalukya Rococo. And people would understand what I meant, because Rococo is a very ornate, uh, floral sort of style, which of course uh, became very popular in Europe in the 17th and 18th century. It's a facetious remark, but what I mean to say is that it shows you the evolution of sculpture. Always pushing ahead, always innovative. So this is the thing about the Chalukyas. They don't repeat, they keep on evolving, developing, combining, making things new. It's one of the most inventive 200 or 150 years of Indian architecture and art, in my opinion. So this is the ceiling over the main aisle as you come into the Papanata Temple of Padmakal. Look at these wonderful brackets, leaping lion-like figure uh, animals from open-jawed makaras, or aquatic monsters, and look at these ornate beams here. And again, you can recognize this upside-down coiled naga that we had in Cave 1 in Badami in the late 6th century. Here, the same motif appears in the early 8th century at Patadakal in a structural temple. And my favorite ceiling panel from the inner mandapa at um, Patadakal's uh, Papanata Temple, a really glorious dancing Shiva in exquisite um, state of preservation. And if some of you are wondering why is Chalukya sculpture not better known, the reason is that except for the three or four panels in Bombay, and I think maybe one in Delhi, there is no Chalukya art in any museum in India, Europe, or America. So if I give this lecture in America, nobody in the States, unless they've been to these places, will ever have seen any of this sculpture. So this is not like Hoysala sculpture, Chola sculpture, examples of which are found in museums all over the world. Chalukya sculpture is still in Chalukya land. You have to go to this part of Karnataka to see it. Now, to finish off, just to show you, there's another tradition. If this wasn't enough to have the South Indian Dravida, the North Indian Nagara, the meeting of these two, the combination of two, we then have a local style, which I'm, I'm calling the Malaprabha Valley style. It's to do with this region, this area of Karnataka, it's not really found anywhere else. And here, it's characterized by these sloping roofs with these funny logs. These are not logs of wood, but logs of stone placed over the joints of the sloping roof slabs. And we have no doubt that this imitated an architecture of wood and thatch, which has completely vanished. All we have are the stone replicas of this architecture. Now, this temple at Aiholi is known as the Lad Khan Temple, because in the end of...